say thanks to God for two things before I proceed. First of all, after I arrived in the Philippines with my wife some years ago in 2010, I was discouraged by some people that it is not possible for a foreigner to preach in the Philippines. And I chose to go on my knees and I prayed for 11 months asking God to give me opportunities to share his word in this country. And after 11 months, I was asked to come and host or speak for a week of prayer here at this very church three years ago. And that was the beginning of an amazing story with the Lord in this country. Secondly, my wife graduated from this school last March. It may not mean anything to you, but my wife will be the first, as I know, the first Seventh-day Adventist nutritionist in my country after over 90 years of Adventism. Why I'm saying this is that the Adventist University of the Philippines is the portal of the Adventism in the Philippines. You stand at a very vantage point whereby you connect the world with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am challenging you, as I've been doing, I have, I'm challenging you to maintain the quality or to upgrade the quality of Adventism on this campus. Amen? Since 2012, when I spoke here, I said I will be praying for this campus. And bet you, I have prayed for this school every morning since 2012. It is my hope that as we discuss one more time the Word of God, something will happen within somebody today that will transform your life for the better. The topic this morning for our consideration is the best prayer ever. This has been a very challenging message. And I thank the organizers because you have pushed me very hard. And when I preach, when I read the Word of God, I ask myself, Lord, will I be able not only to deliver, but to live up to this message? What is the best prayer ever? Well, I remember yesterday or last night for those who came, we learned seven lessons, and the third lesson is the one I want us to take off with. And that lesson said it will drive the message all the way through. Prayer is not only about what God can do for you, but also about what God can do on, in you and through you. Not only what God can do for you, but also what God, God can do in you and through you. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he sees, after he prayed, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And next Jesus says, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. Now the, the rendition in the book of Luke is the second one. The first one is found in Matthew 6. And I chose that one because it's more complete. So Jesus is telling the disciples, if you want a model prayer, if you want to know the best prayer ever, pray what is called today the Lord's Prayer. But the question still stands, what is the best prayer ever? Our Father who art in heaven. Matthew 6, 
9 to 13. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, I used to read this prayer until the organizers of this event told me, hey, pastor, can you speak to us about prayer? And the Holy Spirit redirected me to this prayer, and I discovered something amazing. And it challenged me. Look at it critically. Look at it very carefully. Jesus is saying that when you pray, it's about God's name. Come back, please. God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. Then he proceeds by saying, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now he shifts the focus from God to us, but even in the us, even when the us, the human being comes into the prayer, it is still about God. Give us. God's providence. Forgive us God's forgiveness. Lead us not God's guidance. Deliver us God's deliverance. Folks, brothers and sisters, praying is about God. It's not about us. And then he concludes... For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's kingdom, God's power, God's glory. From the beginning to the end. The Lord's prayer is what it says it is. It is the Lord's prayer. It's about God, who He is. It's about God, what He does. It's about God, what He will always be. The Lord of our lives. The Lord of the universe. Before this, I thought, I used to think that prayer was about me. It is not about me. It's about God all the way. And I was amazed. And when you continue reading in Luke 11, Jesus tells a parable. And then he gives the lesson that he wants us to learn. And he says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Then he says, then Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The prayer is not only about the Father, but also about the Holy Spirit. It is not primarily about us. It's about God, the great God, the creator of the universe, the Father of all humankind. It's about the Spirit. When we pray, we must pray in the Spirit. Have you ever read this verse in Romans 8, 26? Very scary. Very frightening. Romans 8, 26. Paul says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Why? 
Because we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't even know our own prayer requests, says Paul. The only way to know the prayer request, the only way that we ourselves will be informed of our own needs is if we pray in the Spirit because he says, the Spirit himself, not itself, himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The best prayer ever. And then in John 14, 14, the Bible says, If you ask anything in my name, anything in my name, I will do it. In whose name? In the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Remember these points. The first I said, Prayer is not only about what God does for us, but also about what God does in us and through us. And we've seen so far that prayer is about God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They are the focus of prayer, not us. And yesterday we studied part of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. You know, these two, Jesus said, went to the temple and they prayed. And the Pharisees said, God, I thank you. Very good start. That I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican said a very simple prayer, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know, the main difference between the two prayers is that one is self-centered and the other one is God-centered. I will not emphasize this point too much. Prayer is about God. You see the Pharisee? What is the first word in his prayer? God. You see the publican? What is the first word in his prayer? God. Both started with God. But somewhere along the line, the Pharisee drifted and he focused on himself. And Jesus ended the parable by saying that the prayer of the Pharisee couldn't help him because the publican went back home justified, meaning went back home saved. In my little experience, I have learned that when you pray, Jesus can heal you. Amen? When you pray, Jesus can give you an A for that cause. When you pray, Jesus can promote you. Jesus can heal you of that cancer. Jesus can do wonderful things for you as he did for Israelites in the wilderness. Jesus can answer your prayer. But my question is, will he save you? I remember then one passage. Can we? Yes. This is the answer to the question today. The best prayer ever is God-focused, Christ-centered, and Spirit-led. If a prayer doesn't fulfill this, I'm sorry, you have not prayed. I want to review with you the stories of a few Bible characters that I love. I love Bible characters. I love their stories. And people who prayed in the Bible so we could get the point across. The first character is Anna. Anna was a woman whose husband married a second wife because she was barren. Her situation was barrenness. 
Now, that woman came into the house and she started nagging Anna because she was giving birth and Anna, the first wife, was not capable of giving birth. And the life of Anna became so miserable that she describes herself as a woman of a sorrowful spirit. Is there an Anna today here? A woman of a sorrowful spirit. There are many Annas. AUP today, I know they sleep in those dormitories. Some of them are very active in the church. Some of them are even deaconesses. Some of them serve, have been serving for many years, but deep within themselves, they know they are very sorrowful. And Anna understood, like many Bible heroes, that when a situation is like that, when you are in a crisis, you need to pray. So she went to the temple and prayed, and she said, Lord, if you could give me a son. Many people say that Anna's problem, Anna's desire, Anna's need was a child. I disagree. If Anna's need was a child, then why give it away to God? Anna had lost a sense of dignity. So she wanted God to give her back that sense. And when she left the temple, she, the Bible says that she was happy and she regained her lost appetite. Another Bible hero, not a woman this time, but a man, King David. King David, that time, had a problem. He himself created. Actually, he saw a beautiful woman taking her bath. And that was the wife of his soldier. He had wives already. So he chose that, uh, I, I need to taste this one also. So they slept together and uh, the woman became pregnant of him. And then they said, oh, my husband, my husband. And David maneuvered and ended up killing Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. And he took her with him, the king. And... She gave birth to a beautiful boy. You see, God allowed him to go through the childbirth. God allowed them to see their son born. And then God came into the scene and he said, this child will die. David became very disturbed. And he went flat on himself, on his stomach. The Bible says he went flat on his stomach and he prayed with ashes and he prayed and fasted for several days. King David who killed Goliath, he had all rights to tell God, Father, I killed Goliath on your name. I did this and that and this and I'm the king of your kingdom. Please hearken unto my voice. But God was silent and the child died. Amazingly, when David heard that the child was, die, was dead, he rose from his prayer and then went and took a bath and ordered food and he started eating. And the people were amazed. What? But your child just died. He said, hey, folks, when the child was still alive, I could pray something would happen. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise, his will. Now I have to surrender. So my challenge or my question is, if God can say no to David, who do you think you are that God cannot say no to you? Sometimes we think that God must say yes to all our requests. But my point is this, when God says no, what do you do? David went back to normal life. Many times I remember when God said no, I cried the more. I even sometimes cursed him. I said, God, you are so wicked. How can you deny me this wonderful lady? I want to marry her. God says, no. I want to study here. God says, no. I want to do this. God says, no. We must learn that prayer is about God and God's will in our lives. When he says no, like David, we must be able to continue our normal life. No bitterness. Another king, 
Hezekiah. Amazing story. He had a situation. This time, he, he is the one who was sick, not his son. And Isaiah came and he said, hey, King Hezekiah, you're going to die. You know, Hezekiah went and started praying like never before. He prayed to God and God said, told Isaiah, go back and tell him, I am not only healing him, I am adding 15 more years to his life. And then God says, to prove to you that I have the power to answer your prayer, I will make the sundial to go 10 degrees backward. You know, Ezekiah, in Joshua's time, what I did was to make the sun to stand still. But for you, I want to do something unique so that they won't say it happened before. I am going to make the sundial come 10 degrees backward, and it happened. And Ezekiah was healed. And there was a king in a kingdom called Babylon who said, Whoa, something happened. I need to know what happened. And he sent ambassadors to Hezekiah to know what happened. Now, I ask myself, how did the king of Babylon know that something happened to King Hezekiah without Facebook? Then I remembered that Babylonians were good astrologers and astronomers. And what do they study? The stars. And I can envision that day, the scientists of Babylon looking at the sun and looking at the sun. It's going 10 degrees backward. They never saw anything like that. And they inquired, what's going on? And they were told that there is a king in a small kingdom somewhere. His God did that. And the king of Babylon said, Merodach Baladan, I cannot miss this opportunity. I must know this God. So he sent ambassadors with a present. And then, and then, Isaiah comes. When they left, he comes to Hezekiah and says, what did these people see in your house? And Ezekiah goes like, you know, I showed them my Mercedes. I showed them my Lamborghini. I showed them all these uh, frames with the, high, the, the most costly paintings. I, I showed them my wardrobe with all my amenities. I showed them my bank account. I showed myself to them. The Bible says that God came and said, Hey, Hezekiah, you are cursed. And God reversed the prayer. I remember telling you at the beginning of the message, prayer is not only about what God does for you, but also about what God does in you and what God does through you. Hezekiah missed an opportunity. To talk about God to those who visited him. When God answers your prayer, what do you do? When he says no, like David, how do you react? When he says yes, how do you react? Some of us, we pray and we pray, God help me pass this course. God help me graduate. And afterwards... When we pass, we get that A. When we graduate, when we finally marry that lady we loved so much after praying for her so much, when we finally marry that young man, we said, Woo, I am so smart. My uncle told me one time he was in a bus traveling, and there were two ladies gossiping bitterly at the back of the bus. It was very bad, and nobody could stop them. And they were just gossiping and gossiping and gossiping. And at a point, the bus started shaking, and they met an accident. And as the bus started rolling, the lady, one of the ladies says, Lord, save us. Gossip stopped. Miraculously, my uncle says that nobody was injured. The car just stabilized and everyone got out. But what he said really touched me. He said that the two ladies, after walking out of the bus, said something like this. What a skillful driver. Who do you?
you give credit to when your prayer is answered? Another great man, Elijah. Well, Elijah was a great man. You know, in his time, he was the only man who could speak for God. Everybody had left God as he thought. He was a man who could pray and rain would fall. A man who could pray and rain would stop. He was a man who could come to your house, you have no food. Or left a little, he could just speak a word and then the food will just become more and more and more. He could do so many things. He was the man who prayed on Mount Carmel and fire came down from heaven. What a prayer. What an experience. God did something for him. But after that, Jezebel says, since you've attacked me, I will give it to you. And his Elijah started running away. But thank God in the end, he met God somewhere and God told him, Hey, Elijah, get back to work. Do what you're supposed to do. What do you do? After you prayed and God has answered and Satan threatens you, with another challenge. Do you still pray? You are childless and you pray and you pray that you need a child and God gives you that child and you raise that child and that child becomes very sick. Will you still pray? The next character is Daniel. He faced persecution. A young man, very faithful. The Bible says that in the hardest time, he knelt three times a day to pray. I just want to use Daniel to encourage us to pray unceasingly. Some of us are not able to pray consistently for one week. If we take a survey now, if I say how many of us prayed for this week without any break, and if you didn't pray for a whole week, ask yourself why. Don't just sit and say, I didn't pray. What happened? What is going on in me? And Daniel was a great man. He was a very busy man, but he still found time to pray. Students, I have assignments, I have deadlines, professors, faculty, the deans. I have so many things. I have not seen anybody at AUP who is as busy as Daniel. But Daniel found time to talk with God. I didn't say talk to God, to talk with God, because prayer is a conversation. Sometimes some people say, oh, I talked with God. This morning I prayed, and then I asked them, you talked with God? Yes. What did he say? Silence. Jacob, he tricked his brother from the mother's womb all the way through. And he had to run away, 20 years away from home. He never saw his mother. 20 years of slavery in a man's house. 20 years, he ended up with two wives and 13 children. 20 years of suffering. But there was something in Jacob. There was guilt. And he reached a point in his life when he realized that he needed God. So he sent everybody away in Genesis, and, and he was left alone, the Bible says, and he met an angel, and he wrestled with an angel. He wanted to get rid of that guilt because his brother was coming. Twenty years of guilt. Twenty years. Can you imagine that? Some of us have been dragging guilt for years. We know what we did 10 years ago when nobody was there in that dormitory. We know what we did 10, 10 years ago in that office. We know what we did and we are bearing that guilt. Maybe today is the day to pray that guilt away. That you may have peace like Jacob did. And finally Jesus. 
at Gethsemane. He said, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. I want to die. I feel like dying. Jesus felt like dying, but not for the same reason as us. He felt like dying because his father was about to abandon him because the relationship with the father was about to be cut for the first time in his life. Because of our sins, some of us, we, are, we feel like dying for other reasons. We feel like dying because that boy dumped us. How can he dump me? Some of us, we feel like dying because we cannot pass that course. Some of us, we feel like dying because we cannot pay our tuition. Jesus felt like dying for your salvation. You'll be surprised by the best prayer ever. So like Jesus, we must ask ourselves, what is even the purpose of our life? Why do we live? Why are we here when we know our purpose as individuals and as an institution? We will know how to pray. And I picked one of them, Jacob. 20 years of guilt. Cheater and cheated. Well, when Jacob came out of Laban's house, he was very wealthy. Actually, he had two women, two wives, and two concubines. Actually, it's even four. Because he married the ates of his wives. Each of his wives gave him his ate, her ate. Four, 13 children, 12 boys, one girl. Now, you would tell me, hey, Jacob, you are prosperous. You have reached the best in life. You have everything that a human being can need. But Jacob says, the Bible says that Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And he said, Jacob, to the man. The man said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Somebody must start praying this prayer. Every morning, God I am not moving of my room if you don't bless me. God, I am not making any step further in my ministry. I am not making any step further in my teaching. I am not making any step further in my relationship. If you do not bless me, you lay hold of God. You say, God, it's about you. I want you to act in me. Then I looked at the verb, bless me. I thought Jacob had it all. He has not only one, but four wives. In some cultures, more wives reach the richer, the richer you are considered more respectable. I thought having a wife was being blessed. I thought having money because he was really, really rich. Having children, there was something within Jacob that was missing. He felt that he missed something. He, he could have asked so many things. Lord, can you increase my cattle? Can you give me one more car? Can you increase my salary? Hello? Can you give me one more A? Can you give me one more degree? Jacob could have asked so many things, but he realized that it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. He realized that it's about what God can do in you. The Bible says that he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed in Hosea 12, 3 to 5. The Bible says that that night, Jacob wept. Have you ever wept? Not cry. Wept. He wept and sought favor from God. And he found favor. He found God. He found God. He found him. God. Have you ever found God after you prayed? And there God spoke to us. I am the Lord, God of hosts. 
Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling, says Ellen White, and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass before Christ's second coming. What she's saying is this. A time is coming, and the time is now, when the people of God will be so much hated you will be so much hated that every corner they would want to kill you if you are a child of God indeed. And last night I told you that Satan is preparing a terrible world. The world that Satan is preparing for you is an anti-God world, is an anti-gospel world, is an anti-Christian world. Just listen to the news. Check the laws that are being voted in every country, including the Philippines. Check what is going on around. Those who teach when you read those philosophies of education, check the background. Are you ready for that time? One way to stand out during that time is if you know how to pray. And if today you cannot pray for one week, how do you think you will fare during that time? So I want to leave you with a secret prayer for victory. We are going to answer the question, the best prayer ever. What is it? The average Christian, is this thing working? Okay, come back. The average Christian let me say, I'll give that Christian C minus. A C minus Christian prays for forgiveness. I want it to sink deep down. Don't only pray for forgiveness, pray for cleansing also. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse. When was the last time you prayed for cleansing? Now, if you pray for cleansing beyond forgiveness, then you get C or C plus in your Christian walk. Now, majority are there. They stop there. Forgiveness. Forgive me. Amen. They do it again. Forgive me. Amen. They do it. But the prayer goes beyond forgiveness. Cleansing. Don't only pray for cleansing. Pray from the, for deliverance and deliver us from evil, says Jesus. Have you ever prayed that God should deliver you and deliver you from what? Even from the wrong way of praying. One of the challenges that Jesus had with the people back then, and I think he still has the same challenge, is to detach people's mind from earthly to heavenly things. In the book of Acts, after three years, he was about to leave. And he's telling, he's talking to the disciples about the kingdom of God, Acts 1, 6. And the Bible says that the disciples ask him, is this this time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus is saying, I am giving you the world, Samaria, Judea, all the world. They are thinking about Israel. How much of the heavenly do you have in you? So don't only pray for forgiveness or for cleansing, pray for deliverance, but also for empowerment. When was the last time you prayed for empowerment? power to do what is right. Many of us will live a Christianity that is only against sin. We fight against sin. No, Christianity is not only fighting against sin. It is living right. And living right comes with divine power in us. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And then pray for hatred for sin. When was the last time you asked God, God, fill me with hatred for sin. I want to hate sin and love or passion for righteousness. Pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every morning, say this prayer. 
The best prayer ever is the prayer of total surrender. It is not the prayer that heals you from cancer. It is not the prayer that helps you to graduate. It is not the prayer that makes you pay your tuition fees. It is not the prayer that gives you promotion. It is not the prayer that gives you a godly spouse. It is not the prayer that gives you good children. The best prayer ever is the prayer of total surrender. Until we reach that point, there is no prayer. You read your Gospels. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you worry too much about food and water and raiment. These things, pagans seek after them. Pagans. The things that pagans strive for. These are what we Christians take as our best prayer points. Come on, church. There is something greater that God wants to do for us. There is something deeper that God wants to do in us. There is something greater that God wants to do through us than just giving us food and water and degrees and spouses and children. God wants to save you. The prayer of total surrender is a prayer where self is dethroned, even as Christ is enthroned in heart. Puso, in heart. Puso, if God is not in my puso, I am not praying. Then God must rule my life. And that prayer, as I close, was beautifully coined in a song titled, Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Say this to the proud and boastful Pharisee who attends PIC every Sabbath, thinking that he is holier than the rest of the congregation, thinking that because he has an office or because he is a teacher or because he is whatever he is, he thinks that this church belongs to him. Tell that Pharisee, not I but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I but Christ, be seen, be known. Be heard, not I but Christ, young man. Not I but Christ in every look and action. Tell them, not I but Christ in every thought and word. To those who are psychologists and counselors and pastors, you deal with people's emotions, you, you, you help them, you, you comfort them. I want you to know that it's about not I but Christ to gently soothe in sorrow. Not I but Christ to wipe the falling tear. Not I but Christ to hush away all fear. Christ, only Christ. No self-important bearing. Come back, please. Christ, not I, but Christ. My strength and health to be to the cancer patient, to the one who is chronically sick. Not I, but Christ, my strength. To the alcoholic, to the prostitute, to the drug addict. Tell them, Christ, only Christ for body, soul, and spirit. Tell them to pray that prayer that is about Christ. Christ, only Christ, here and eternally. The best prayer ever is the prayer that makes Christ the ruler of our life. If you haven't prayed that way, you still have a long way to go. So I am challenging you, my brothers and my sisters, as we close today's message, to seek to pray that kind of prayer every day. The prayer that makes God first and last in everything. The prayer that gives glory to God alone. The prayer that makes of Christ the ruler of my heart, the ruler of my life, 
the prayer that gives God his rightful place. Not the prayer that makes me become great, but the prayer that makes Christ greater in me as I become smaller and smaller. May I see the hand of somebody who is saying, Lord, help me to pray. Teach me to pray like that. I want to pray like that. May I see your hand. May the Lord bless you as you commit yourself to pray like this every single day. May God bless his holy word. Amen. We have been blessed by the message this morning, and now it is opportunity to bless others.